Stanford University. The Human Experience. Inside the Humanities at Stanford University. Humanexperience.stanford.edu. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. We asked the deans of the professional schools to come in and talk to us about things they think are necessary or what they look for in terms of uh, majors as students are applying for or coming to their particular schools. So we're blessed that they were able to come today and that you're getting, in a sense, inside information that helps you think about those choices you're making in terms of your own education. How many people at this point sitting out there have selected a major? All right, so there, there's, there's time, right? And uh, so um, I'm going to introduce them to you, and then what we're going to do is we're going to go down, starting with uh, Dean Sullender here, and, and just hear um, from each of them a little bit about uh, what they're thinking about in terms of majors, what they look for in terms of applicants. So please, a hand for all our deans. So thank you, Harry, and thank you all for, for having me here this evening. Um, so first, let's, let's start with uh, the first myth I'll, I'll talk about this evening, the, the belief that a liberal arts undergraduate experience and a graduate professional education are at odds. Uh, so that's, that's just not true. That's a false choice. Uh, that's like saying uh, Stanford cannot be great at academics uh, and win the Orange Bowl. Uh, Leland Stanford said, uh, I attach great importance to general literature for the enlargement of the mind and for giving business capacity. The imagination needs to be cultivated and developed to assure success in life. A man will never construct anything he cannot conceive. Same could be said for a woman. Uh, so our world's complexity requires that uh, people have the skills to think across disciplines. The big problems of the world no longer come uh, in nice, neat buckets. And so this flexibility of mind that allows you to think across disciplines uh, is crucial to, to business as well as uh, the other uh, professions you'll see represented up here. And of course, you get that uh, in abundance in a liberal arts education. So I'm going to try, uh, in, in the time I have, to touch very briefly uh, on five topics. Uh, why liberal arts education is ideal prep for, for business school. Uh, tell you a little bit about what we do at the GSB. I'll give you a few statistics uh, regarding the GSB class. Uh, I'll tell you in a little bit of depth, if I can manage it, uh, some stories of GSB alumni who, uh, who pursued liberal arts uh, educations before coming to the GSB. And then if I have time, which uh, I may well not, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle a few other myths that might be worth uh, dispelling. So uh, ultimately, the, the goal of a liberal arts education uh, is to develop individuals who are open-minded uh, but not empty-headed. <laughs> and we believe and hope that your IHUM requirements take care of that. Uh, we don't think of a liberal arts degree or even a science degree as training for a particular job, and that's good for the reasons that I've described. It's, uh, it's much more important than a specific job. It provides broadly useful benefits that are powerful when combined with the kind of management education you would get at the GSB. So it helps you to form and integrate abstract concepts. It helps you to think independently. It helps you to do disaggregation analysis and synthesis. Uh, it helps uh, you learn how to learn, and it helps you to empathize, which are all really important skills that we use uh, in management education. And I think you get all of that out of a liberal arts education. So let me tell you a little bit about what we do at the GSB and, and how this education relates. So how do we, how do we approach uh, admissions uh, at the GSB? Well, what, we're, what we try to do when we select a class is we look for individuals who have the potential to have a major impact on the world through managed organizations in their lives. Right? That's really what we're, we're looking for. We're looking for the potential for impact. The mantra of the GSB is change lives, change organizations, change the world. Uh, we take that seriously. We're looking for people who can do that. 
Uh, and the people with that capability do not come from any particular discipline or background. They come from a very wide variety of backgrounds and experiences, and we're happy to take them from all of those uh, walks of life. Uh, and you may have heard that over the last few years we rebuilt our curriculum. One of the key objectives in rebuilding the curriculum was precisely to make it possible for us to, do, to deal with that diversity of background and experience uh, through the curriculum rather than forcing us to select a particular subset uh, of backgrounds coming in. Uh, we use the two years we have with the, this extraordinary group of people uh, who we admit into the GSB to try to provide them with a transformative experience that will launch them on a career uh, of impact and meaning, and that's really what we do uh, at the GSB, and we do it in, in three main ways. We have a focus on critical analytical thinking, we have a focus on what we call personal leadership development, uh, and a focus on innovative thinking, because the, the big problems of business first need to be analyzed critically, uh, then you have to think creatively about how to come up with solutions. And finally, you need the interpersonal skills and leadership skills to know how to lead through others to solve those problems. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, what it is we're trying to achieve uh, in the education that we're providing uh, at the GSB. So I, I said we admit a very diverse group. How diverse a group is it? Well, we have uh, 107 undergraduate majors among the 390 first-year students. So if you think we're looking for a particular kind of student, it's just not reflected in the numbers. Uh, majors, who, for example, that are represented this year include archaeology, American studies, art, Asian languages and cultures, classics, development studies, drama, economics, English ethics, film studies, French, German, cultural studies, government history, international relations, Italian, peace and conflict studies, philosophy, political science, public policy, psychology, religion, <laughs> rhetoric, social anthropology, social studies, Spanish, and urban studies. So I hope you recognize yourself in there somewhere. Uh, we, have, uh, we have just about every major you can think of represented in the GSB class. If we divide the GSB students into three groups based on what they studied as undergraduates, think business, engineering, uh, business, engineering, and natural sciences, and thirdly, humanities and the social sciences, which do you think is the most represented in the, in the GSB class? Again, business, engineering, and natural sciences, humanities, and social sciences. Well, uh, humanities and social sciences account for 49% of our class. Uh, engineering and natural sciences, 33%. And business, just 18%. And that's actually a little bit higher this year than usual. Usually we run around 12 to 13 percent. So let me tell you just a, a couple of stories uh, about some of our, uh, our alumni to give you a sense of the kind of backgrounds they come in with and where they go, uh, where they go with them. Uh, Jeff Bukas uh, majored in philosophy at Yale. He worked as a researcher for the documentary unit at NBC News for a year uh, and then came to Stanford for his MBA. Uh, after graduation, he joined a startup company called Home Box Office. Today, Jeff is chairman and CEO of Time Warner, the world's largest media company. You remember the slogan, it's not TV, it's HBO? Well, when Jeff joined in 1979, it was just TV. <laughs> he launched Sex and the City, The Sopranos, Entourage, and other award-winning shows that built the network. Uh, at the Golden Globes last month, Jeff was seated between Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. Uh, he'll tell you that his MBA was of great value as he built HBO and now as he heads all of Time Warner. Uh, I also believe, however, that uh, if you talk to Jeff about his background, uh, he will say that studying philosophy was invaluable, uh, what it means to be human, what it takes to be happy, and how to use wisely the power science and technology provide. Sandra Horbach majored in Chinese and economics at Wellesley. When China opened to US citizens in 1980, Sandra was one of the first to go. She postponed her job on Wall Street to move to Beijing as a Fulbright scholar. She came to Stanford and with exposure to strategy and operations from the GSB, entered the emerging field of private equity. Today, Sandra runs global consumer and retail at the Carlyle Group, 
the largest private equity fund in the world. Finally, Phil Knight majored in journalism at the University of Oregon, spent a year in the US Army before coming to Stanford to earn his MBA. He was working as an accountant when he began to modify running shoes on a waffle iron and sell them out of the trunk of his car. This is a man who followed his own path. Do you recognize Phil's name? You will if you recognize the new Knight Management Center, which is the new home of the business school on the other side of campus or if you look at your shoes and you see the iconic swoosh of Nike, as Phil is the founder and chairman of Nike. So uh, in a couple of minutes, let me just uh, hit on another couple of myths uh, associated uh, with uh, liberal arts education and business. Uh, first myth is you need to work in consulting or banking. Uh, we have 270 different companies represented among our 390 first year MBAs. Our students include some who were candy store owners, professional ballerinas, teachers, brand managers, Los Angeles Lakers, medical researchers, television producers, government officials, wind farm developers, and just about everything else you can imagine. Myth number two is that the GSB doesn't like Stanford undergrads. We call this group our double dippers, and we're very big fans. Stanford is always number one or number two, actually, among the most represented undergraduate institutions uh, at the GSB. And it's not surprising. Uh, we share an ethos. If you like the culture and academic environment as an undergraduate, you'll love the GSB. Uh, the flip side is that some of you may feel you must try a different school for your MBA purely for resume diversification. Uh, though I admit there are good schools uh, elsewhere, this is actually pretty silly. Stanford has a sterling reputation, uh, not only as an undergraduate institution, of course, but as a graduate school as well. And people who find out you've gone to Stanford twice will simply think that you have good taste. Uh, myth number three, there's a preferred timeline for attending business school. Uh, the median student at Stanford, at the GSB, has worked for four years. Uh, but that's not a preference of the schools. That's the way people come to us through the admissions process. We have the whole range around that. Uh, in fact, this year, our older student could have given birth to our younger student. Uh, final myth, uh, and then I'll hand it on, uh, is that business school is a boys' club. Uh, as the father of three daughters, uh, one of whom has already attended the GSB, I can tell you I'm passionate about opportunities for women. The GSB comprises about 40% women and is working actively to attract, recruit, and support women. So I hope that uh, lays several uh, myths to rest. And with that, I will hand it on. So again, I'm Charles Prober. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Medical Education at the School of Medicine and have been at the school for a long time. My boss, who is traveling, is Phil Pizzo, who is the Dean of the School of Medicine. Uh, let me do things a, a little bit differently. I think that the big myth that is meant to be dispelled for all of us, uh, so let me just do that right off the top, which is to talk about a liberal arts education as relates to medical school. We, like the business school, and we'll see what the other guys say, love a liberal arts education. I actually didn't bring my notes from the admission class from last year where I, too, went down the list of all of the degrees, the majors that the students had participated in. Uh, certainly more than 50% of them were not in human biology or an equivalent. One of my favorites that I do remember is we had a student uh, who was at Harvard studying uh, theology, ethics, and politics all together. Now that was strange to me, and I called them out any number of times to ask how those three related to each other, because they seem to be disparate, theology, ethics, and politics, but I won't dwell on that now. But the point is that many of the students come in with a liberal arts education, and we value that at least as equally as an education that focuses on human biology. You will get, if you come to any medical school, you will receive a lot of human biology, so you don't need to come equipped with it. That's not to say we don't like human biology, because we do, but liberal arts education is deeply valued. Um, in terms of medical schools in general, uh, as you probably know, there's a whole bunch of them in North America, north of about 135. 
Um, we are but one. We happen to be a relatively small one uh, in size. We have 86 students who, uh, God only knows how we came up with 86, but 86 who matriculate in any particular year. Uh, the largest school in North America, I think, is about 290 students, happens to be in British Columbia. And then there's any number of uh, students in schools in between. The number of applicants to medical schools in the United States in any given year is about 35 to 40,000. The number of persons accepted into medical school is about 17,000. So it's about a 50% hit rate sort of across the country. Uh, for our school specifically, uh, we're fortunate to have a large applicant pool. We uh, receive typically between six and 7,000 applicants, so we get a, a large proportion of the total applicant pool. We interview uh, about 450 in any year, and we matriculate 86 in any year. So how do we decide which of those students to actually bring into the interview pool with difficulty? Um, do we look at academic performance? Yes, uh, we do. We look at the GPA, but we are not seeking GPAs of four or whatever the maximum number you can have on top of four. Uh, we are looking for somebody who has done well in college, but uh, the definition of well is influenced by the rest of the application. Do we look at MCATs? We do currently, um, although they are not critically important to us. Um, we, in fact, uh, take MCAT scores that predictably will uh, have the students struggling a bit in some of the early courses in medical school. We know this statistically, that they will struggle a bit. That's okay because the rest of their application, which I'll talk about in a minute, is more important. Um, we could, I am confident, have students with perfect MCAT scores, which, by the way, would influence our ranking in U.S. News and World Report, which is a bit sick. Uh, the fact that that is, in fact, a, something that they look at in ranking medical schools. Our argument back to U.S. News and World Report, if one takes the energy to argue back, my boss does actually, <laughs> even though he doesn't believe in it, um, is that if you actually restrict students to a very specific and very high MCAT scores, you're probably going to do something in terms of tilting the selection away from some desired factors. So we look at it, but we don't regard it with critical importance. Um, I'm going to read you the, the educational mission statement of our school and then reflect on what we look at for students that we think will help us fulfill the mission of our education program. Uh, and this is our mission statement. It's short. To prepare physicians who will provide outstanding patient-centered care and inspire future leaders who will improve world health through scholarship and innovation. And I'm sort of used to reading this because I'm now greeting all of our, we're right in the middle of recruitment season right now. And as we bring the students through, this is something that I read to them. And then I try to reflect on each of the words and reflect on it in terms of what we look for in students. So we are a medical school. We are interested in preparing physicians. We believe, and I don't know how many of you regularly see physicians, we believe that the complete physician is somebody not only who knows their biology and maybe their physics and chemistry, but probably not, but rather somebody who knows people, who understands stories, who listens to stories, because illnesses are, story, are, are scripted stories, and who can work with the patient with compassion and empathy. That which, is, which grows not so much from the physics course you take or the chemistry or the other pre-med requirements required by most schools, but that which actually more derives from your breadth of education in history and literature and other elements of your education. So that's the physician part and the patient-centered part. Inspiring future leaders. As I say to the incoming class, I'm used to saying this, the reason we think we can inspire future leaders is because we select from that large pool, the 450 and then the 86 that we select, on the basis of them already showing us that they have leadership qualities. And how does one show that one has leadership qualities? By virtue of what you've done during your undergraduate years, uh, both in school and outside of school. What you've done in volunteerism in a community. What you've done in perhaps uh, organizing or leading a particular uh, 
society or NGO or anything else. We have many students who are teachers. I'm looking to my colleague to my left. They have demonstrated their leadership ability by leading a class of students through their studies. So we identify leadership qualities in terms of the diverse attributes that our students have as undergraduates or things they've done between graduating from college and applying to medical school. World health, we look at our students in terms, it is in our mission statement, we look at our students in terms of the experience that they've had. Uh, and many have had, have had experiences on undergraduates in doing semesters abroad and been enriched by that. Not all, but many. Um, and medicine is on the world stage. And then finally, scholarship and innovation. We look at their scholarship, and I've already mentioned that, and we look at what they've done in their own educational pathways that may have been innovative uh, because we think that those are important characteristics. So we look at everything. Uh, the, the application is actually quite thick. We look at academic readiness, and that's, again, the major, the performance, the MCAT, with the discounting that I've already mentioned. We, looked at, we look at the preparedness in terms of taking on a career in medicine and things that are important there if, if the students have had an opportunity to shadow, to have a clinical experience of some sort, both so that they determine themselves that this is something that they likely are going to enjoy and that when the people write about them in, from those shadowing experiences, they say this particular student clearly has an affinity for working with people. Working with people turns out to be quite important. Uh, so we look at all of, we look at the full uh, application in terms of all of those different characteristics. Uh, and again, back to the first point in terms of what majors the students have, having a liberal arts education is highly valued. Many of our students, like the students that go to the business school, don't come straight out of college into medical school. Some do. So our youngest matriculants are 20, but our average matriculant is 24 to 25. And the time between graduating from college and coming to our school is spent in many different ways. I've already alluded to those who have, have taught, uh, either with Teach for America or some other program. That's actually quite common in our students. Other students have been in business. Other students have done a second degree. About 20% of our entering class will have a second degree. And there's a variety of life experiences that the students may have had before they come into medical school. We look at those experiences. And finally, we look at distance traveled among our students. We look at what the student has had to overcome in terms of barriers. And those barriers may be economic barriers. Those barriers may be racial barriers. Those barriers may come in a variety of different forms. And how the student has performed against those barriers. Um, that's obviously not true of all of our students, uh, but true of some. So we look at that entire package in order to, to come together with our 86 students that we bring into the school. Um, when we look at our, our uh, farm teams, I guess, or the feeder schools, Stanford is certainly number one in our medical school. Um, of our 86 students uh, that came in last year, 22 of them were from Stanford. Our other common schools are Harvard, Yale, Hopkins, but we also have, if we look at all of the schools representing our 86 students, there's typically about 40 schools represented. In terms of sex distribution, over 10 years, we've been about 52% women, about 48% men. There are actually still more male applicants to medical schools in the United States, but it's getting close to 50-50. But our class is slightly more women than men, again, over that 10-year average. So let me stop at this point and pass it to uh, my colleague from the School of Education and look forward to your questions and comments. So I'm not competitive, but in the implicit competition of who values liberal arts education the most, uh, I can actually say that in the field of education, there are some programs where it's a requirement, not just something that we value very much. One, one point I want to make about going into the field of education and going to a professional school in education is that we're preparing people for a very diverse set of jobs. I think this is actually more true among all the professional schools than you might think. It used to be maybe even 20 years ago that if you wanted to go into education, you wanted to become a teacher, you wanted to become an administrator, you wanted to be a researcher. Um, those were essentially the three options. Now we have charter schools and charter school management organizations. Foundations are seeking people who have backgrounds in education. There are school reform organizations. There are poli policy 
contexts in which people with education backgrounds are sought after, uh, people who do evaluation, um, after school programs, out of school programs, technology. They're just a myriad uh, areas of work that people can do with, uh, with education backgrounds. And the particular program or the area of work that our students envision uh, will determine to some to a substantial degree what we're looking at for uh, qualities in new students. If you want to get a PhD in the philosophy or the history of education, um, then it's really important that you have a very strong background, if not a major, in those areas. If you want to uh, teach in teach history or teach English, needless to say, it's absolutely a requirement that you have either a major or a very, very strong background from your college experiences in those fields. Um, we, we also have programs in economics and sociology and a lot, of the socio a lot of the social sciences. We have programs that are preparing people for policy positions. Um, we have a higher education program that is preparing people to study or work in higher education contexts. Um, we have international comparative programs. So there's just, just huge diversity in the jobs we're preparing people for and huge diversity in the particular kinds of experiences and requirements that we have for our particular programs. There are a couple of qualities that transcend everything. Two are analytic skills and writing skills. And in my experience, a liberal arts education prepares you better develops those skills better than just about any other, perhaps any other uh, area of um, higher education or major in higher, higher education. Writing skills in particular. Uh, if you are a history major, an English major, you're, or philosophy, you're much more likely to have a lot of writing to do and to get feedback on it to develop those skills. And those are, those are skills that are, frankly, they are valuable no matter what you do. I, I, I'm sure that my colleagues would, would uh, be with me in claiming that that's something that we look for when we're looking at applicants. Leadership is important, and that can be in a variety of contexts, but I think we see ourselves as preparing people who are leaders in their fields, not just good, and in fact, I don't have specific examples. Well, actually, we do have one president of Peru. I think that almost trumps uh, <laughs> the business school. Uh, but, but we do have people who be, ha take leadership positions. And even when we're preparing teachers, we think of ourselves, and we have good evidence that we're successful at this, we're preparing people to play leadership roles in schools and districts, uh, uh, not, not be uh, to be more than classroom teachers, although that's a substantial <laughs> thing to be. We also look a lot at real world experience and breadth of experience. Um, and again, not in any particular area, but we, we want people who have, we feel confident, have some maturity. They have some experience under their belt besides school. It can be achieved while you're in school. And some of the experiences that our Stanford undergraduates have are totally awesome and mind-boggling to me. H how our Stanford undergraduates fit in the rich work that they do, sometimes in other countries, sometimes um, right in their own backyard, but really important work, that's valued. So we don't just look at what courses student uh, applicants have taken or what their grades are. We want people who have breadth and richness of experience in their backgrounds. Um, there are a variety of things that Stanford undergraduates can do to prepare themselves f f to look good, so to speak, as an applicant to an education school, whether it's our own or another one. And there are a few others that are kind of okay, even though ours is certainly the best. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that you are aware of these because some of them are relatively new. Whatever your major, you can do an honors thesis in education. We have a theme house, um, a dorm that you can live in if you're interested in education. There are many research experiences and research opportunities that undergraduates um, have in our school and can take advantage of. Um, we have many undergraduates who take our courses. 
Uh, in fact, we even teach courses that are specifically related to the humanities, like the philosophy of education. We offer one course occasionally that's on children's literature that might be of interest to an English major. There are also a number of volunteer opportunities and activities that we do jointly with the Haas Center. So we have a program called Ravenswood, Ravenswood Reads, where students take a course from a Stanford uh, faculty member in the School of Education on the teaching of reading and specifically on tutoring. And while they're taking the course, they're tutoring, tutoring a child in uh, East Palo Alto Elementary School. It's quite serious. Uh, they video, we vid they, students videotape each other, analyze the videos, and so on. So you actually get a sense of what it's like to be a teacher, what it's like to work in a school. You're learning about the teaching of reading. Um, and having an opportunity to give back and do service to the community. We have another program where you can work in a preschool and take a seminar on early childhood education, child develop, or young uh, child development in the um, preschool years, and uh, spend time working with kids in a preschool also in East, East East Palo Alto. So there are lots of opportunities, I think, to demonstrate your, your commitment and interest in education largely, but there are also lots of, lots of professions that you can think of education professional schools as being a preparation for. We love humanities students um, and would be happy to have you take advantage of some of the opportunities that we have now for you while you're still undergraduates at Stanford. Try and be short, just because um, I think we've all gone on, and there's so much to say about each of our schools. Um, with I won't talk much about the Stanford Law School in particular, except I think I would echo the themes of the others with respect to their schools, which is we're small. We like Stanford University also. It's probably our number one feeder school, although for us that's still a relatively small number, all things considered. So we try in our admissions policy, as do most, I think, of the top law schools, uh, geographical diversity. Uh, and diversity in terms of the university students come from is actually an explicit goal. So we usually have people from 40 different states and from you know 50 to 75 different universities in a relatively small class. Um, so, but, but think about law just generally. Um, we're like education in the sense that there is no track. There's no, you know, we take lots of people from Brown where you have no idea what they did as undergraduates. Um, I mean, it's just, and it doesn't, and it doesn't matter if anything, I suppose our problem uh, has been on the opposite side, which is actually getting people who have science and math backgrounds to think that law school is for them. And that has started to change over the last few years. So we finally have a, a what I regard as a healthier mix with people from across, and not just, just from the humanities or social sciences, which had been the most traditional uh, feeders into law school. Um, let me s talk a little bit about, though, I think what matters uh, for us when we think about admissions. So, you know, we do have, and this would be true for all, all the top law schools. There are a lot of great law schools, by the way. And I'd be happy to talk about this for those of you who have been reading the New York Times uh, lately. In fact, it's still a pretty good value proposition, all things considered, to go to any of them. And seriously, that was a horrible article. I got very angry. I actually wrote a friend at the Times. It was like Fox News journalism. Um, but uh, most law schools are relatively the same about this, which is we have a basic numbers cutoff in terms of GPA and LSATs. Um, and it, but it, it gives us a very large pool of people. And so once you get over that threshold, what we're really looking for is just, you know, who are the applicants within this pool who seem the most interesting, the most inquisitive, the most ambitious, the most likely to take what it is that we're going to offer them in terms of a degree and do something with it that's interesting, whether within the technical legal profession or outside. Um, and, and as I say, I think that's really the focus. Um, we look carefully at transcripts, as I think do all the top schools, but what we're looking for is not so much did you check off some particular set of courses? Um, do you look like you got a broad education? In that sense, I think the liberal arts commitment remains deep. Um, but of course, it includes uh, numeracy, as I'll talk about in a second. Um, we do look, you know, uh, if someone, you know, has a really high GPA, but it looks like they loaded up their transcript with gut courses. I don't know if they call them guts here, but, you know, easy courses or, you know, w with, uh, you know, majors that didn't challenge them in any sense, you know, that will count against. We look for people who do seem to have want to challenge themselves uh, in their undergraduate 
education. But beyond that, there really is no sort of advice about what to do. Well, let me say that differently. There's a traditional set of advice, which many of you may have heard. So let me say what that is, and then, I, and then why you shouldn't pay attention to that. So the traditional advice, it's not that it's bad, but that to get into law school, you wanted to make sure that you studied history, philosophy, economics, political science. Any of those majors worked, and you certainly wanted to know a little bit of all of those. What I would say is you certainly want to know a little bit of all of those, but not to get into law school. It's, it's not, we don't particularly need it for that purpose, but you'd be you know, insane to go through four years at a university like this or any top university and not study a little history, a little philosophy, a little economics, and a little polit political science along the way. What I do think we look for and what, I, you, know, what you want to be building while you're choosing your courses so I want to echo something De Deborah said for sure, which is writing skills. Writing skills are absolutely critical. Uh, I think that's probably true for any profession. It's, you know, I mean, it's hard to ex describe just how true it is for law because, of course, you know, language is the means by which all the communication takes place, um, and written language in particular. Someone once, I want to do this myself formally, I've been told that someone once took uh, law exams first year class and had them graded by the law professor and then had an English graduate student grade them who knew nothing about law and the grades were pretty much the same, which tells you something. Um, so beyond writing skills, I think what we look for, and again, this is to echo something I think Garth touched on, is, is we want people who look like they've learned how to learn, right, that they've managed, you know, in undergraduates, it's an interesting thing in this country, it's sort of 18 to 21, those are big growing up years, but, but they're also years in which we want people who will be able to come and really pick up what it is that we're going to do in graduate school, because it's going to be different. It's more focused, it's, it's, it's more skills oriented in a different kind of way than what you did as an undergraduate, and so we want a sense of people who, who know how to do that, who can really learn and that's what they've learned as much as anything else. Now, I, what does that mean? Again, it's something you're, there's no particular set of courses to take. We, we like people who, you know, have shown the ability to work in teams, both because that's key to learning to learn and key to actually functioning in the world. Um, problem solving, which was touched on by some of the others. And, you know, and that one does, you know, that says people who've thought a little bit about decision making, who will have thought a little bit about organizational behavior, and who will have done some of this, you know, in their activities, whether inside or outside the university. Analytical ability is obviously critical. Um, and the only piece I want to fold in, I think working with numbers is also key. So to me, that should be part of a liberal arts education. I, I think it is part of a liberal arts education. The way this thing has gotten framed in recent years, it tends to be, you know, what we're, what we're out here doing is trying to persuade people that you don't have to only learn how to work with numbers, but you do want to learn how to do that um, a, as a piece of what you do. So it's a pretty a broad array of things uh, that you want to think about putting together, and you can do it within any number of majors, but mostly being in a liberal arts university, you can, you can do it, you know, broadly and cutting across a lot of different fields. Uh, the last piece of advice that I just want to offer, um, and, and again, this is like the business school. I think Deborah touched on this as well. So did Charles. Um, we take people straight out of college. We have no rule about that one way or the other. But if you think we love people who've done something else. Who've had a, you know, who've, who've gotten some experience in the world of some sort. Um, that's partly because we think if they do come to law school at that point, they will come with more of a sense of why they're coming. Uh, they'll have had a chance to be out in the world and begin to think about whether this is really what they want to do. Um, they'll be a little more mature about the education. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, even apart from all that, you should do it. <laughs> I mean, you, when you, you come to graduate school and then you're going to finish and you're going to be on your career and then the rest of your life is that. You know, you're building your career. So this is really one of the last opportunities you're going to get to just do something because you want to. And, and we like that, you know. It's like take the time. So don't think about that time as, you know, what's the job that I can take will, that will make my application to law school more appealing? So what we get is, and this is nothing against Teach for America, but Teach for America, which started out as a wonderful program to develop teachers, has now become a credential. And so we get a million applicants who did Teach for America because they weren't interested in teaching. They did it for the minimum two years so that they could apply to law school and look good. And you know, we're not stupid. Everybody picks that up. It's a good thing to do. If you want to do Teach for America, do Teach for America. But don't do it because you think it'll build up your application. The idea is find something that is really a passion for you and go do that for a few years. And, and the reason that really helps on the application process is because as I said at the beginning, what we try and do is once you get over the numbers threshold, we're looking for people who look like 
right, they, they, you know, they have their own, they're not just checking off the boxes, they're not, you know, following the path that they've been told to follow, they're, they're, they have a chance, they look like they're going to be leaders, they're interesting, they're ambitious, and to be honest, somebody who has, you know, done something, just on average is more likely to look interesting than somebody who hasn't. And so, you know, people, it's people who've spent their time in school and then come onto another school, that's fine, and as I say, we do take people, but, it's just better all around for you, for, for you know, all respects, to actually take some time after and explore your interests a little further and do something that, that you might have a passion for. So let me stop there. I got to take a, a, a course in organizational behavior, actually, as an, as an undergraduate, which completely open, you know, open my, my eyes to the, the whole people <laughs> side of, of organizations and, and, and management and teams and motivation and incentives and uh, had a very long lasting impact on, on the way I looked at the world. Actually, I, you know, just because the course that did this for me was actually a course in law school, but mm -hmm. it touches on these themes really nicely. So, because I, I only went to law school because my mother was like on my back so much to do something. And because I graduated from college and I moved to New York and I was hanging out with my friends and trying to be a writer. I thought I was okay. I wasn't. Um, but I didn't know that at the time. And my mother, and so I went to law school planning to drop out, figuring I would go for six weeks and say, I tried, I hated, I'm going back to New York. And there was a course there offered, it was called Elements of the Law. It was taught by Edward Levy, who had been the Attorney General of the United States, mm -hmm. and the president at the University of Chicago, and was now just back teaching. And it essentially started mm -hmm. with the, um, the debate about whether might makes right between Thrasymachus and Socrates in the Republic, and it ended with Roe v. Wade. And it did pretty much everything in between. And what it, and what it gave me a sense of, because you know you, you, we read everything in the course from a lot of law cases about Rousseau and Locke and Hobbes, and, and it, it gave me this strong sense of the connection that law had to, to everything, to philosophy, to literature, to, to science, to economics, to business. And, and, and that's what, uh, I stayed in law school as a result of that, actually. I became Levy's research assistant, in fact, and worked with him for two years. But it, that is true, and it's really true of all of the professions. And that, it's hard to get, you know. And so when you get a picture of the lay of the land, you realize that everything you do, you'll be able to bring to bear on this in ways that will make you better at it. Um, so that was really the course for me. Thank you. I was a psych major and interested in child development. I took a course in epistemology, which was in the philosophy, the philosophy department, and I think what struck me was the degree to which our philosophy of knowledge influences our beliefs about how people learn, and that you can't really understand learning, which is something I was interested in, without understanding those deep roots, uh, those deep philosophical roots. And in fact, I went to Geneva, Switzerland for a year after I finished my undergraduate degree and studied in a program that was on epistemology, but it happened to be headed by Jean Piaget, who was, at the time, the best known uh, developmental psychologist in the country. Um, so for Jean Piaget, there was absolutely n the, the intersection of philosophy and <clears throat> psychology was where all the action was. Um, and so I think appreciating the, the deep interconnections of those very different disciplines was very, very influential. Thank you. So if I got a contrast for you. <laughs> so when I started college in the old country, which is Canada, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer too. Um, and I took all of the courses that I thought were relevant to law, which was back some time ago. So I took French, because I'm Canadian, so you got to speak French, because the law is kind of the book. So I took French, I took political science, and, like and a couple of other courses. And then I sort of decided, uh, law doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I think medicine makes sense. So I took all of the pre-medical requirements. I had no liberal arts background. I, I suffered from that. I, I'll come back to that in a second. But my growth experience was outside of uh, these, these college degrees, which was working at the YMCA, being a physical director there, playing football and that kind of stuff, which taught me the value of working with people. And a lot of the stuff I did was working with children and ultimately inspired me to continue to work with children. And I'm a pediatrician. Now, back in that day, you actually didn't have to get a degree to get into medical school. Uh, so I, 
my wife, who graduated from Harvard, reminds me constantly that you do not have a degree. Well, I did get an MD, so I actually do have a, a medical degree. But, and, and in fact, as I, as I think back on that and now realize that what is most enriching to me academically presently, I read the medical literature like crazy, but with the help of Kindle, thank you for Amazon. Was he a graduate from here too? No. 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 He, he has, Although the person that runs, that runs the Kindle division was. Was. Well, there you go. So I now recognize a little bit late in life, although it's been, it's been a few years, that reading these literary books and reading about stories both of uh, historical importance and the fictional books enrich me in what I now think uh, is the most important thing to me in being a physician and teaching and uh, selecting and training future physicians. So the literary background that I'm now getting is sort of late. Uh, as opposed to early, but it, it makes me think that, boy, I wish I had actually gotten into this when I was 18 or 19 and, and really developed myself as a, in a liberal arts background, because it really is very, very enriching. But I don't have a college degree. <laughs>
and doing activities. And, and so by the time you get to us, what you've imbibed out of all this is that the route to success is to collect as many gold stars as you can and to keep your options open. And the truth is that is a horrible formula for real success in life. And, and then you come, you know, so what we experience, for instance, at the law school are people who they, they come, they go to the big firms. And, and the reason they're doing that is not the dad, it's none of those things. It's that it keeps their options open and it's another gold star and they're afraid to make a choice. And, you know, that's the one thing you don't need. If, if you had the qualities that got you into a place like Stanford, you can take chances with your life. You're going to be fine no matter what. And it's better to do that than to sort of stick on this, you know, I'm going to keep my options open and do the things that look like gold stars. Because at some point you do have to make a choice. And, and it's scary to me how many people, by the time they get to that point, the choices have been made for them by the choices they didn't make in getting to where they were. So that's just, you know, if I could do one thing to change people's psychology, it would be to shake people out of that. Um, well, I think another way to think about that, too, is if I, if I think about the people I know who are successful and happy, oh, yeah. they are people who follow their passion. And they were not strategic. They did what they loved doing. Uh, and I, I think that that's the best route to success, because if you're doing what you don't love, you're not going to be very successful, and you're certainly not going to be happy. Each of us has sort of commented on that uh, along the way, which is uh, a gap year to do something that you care deeply about. So the passion is very important, as Larry just said, that in fact enriches uh, your life story uh, is added value, at least from the medical school's perspective, more often than not. Uh, we each said, I think, that we sometimes admit students straight out of college, uh, but more often your statistic is cor correct if it's representing Stanford Medical School admission age. It's about 24 and a half years. Um, and that gap is filled with any number of different things the students uh, have, have uh, pursued. Again, some a second degree, some working in, in industry, some teach for America, some who have been business consultants. And what comes across in their application, if we're reading it correctly, and ultimately when, they see, when we see the students and test it, is that they did that, at least as far as we can figure out, they did that because they care deeply about it. And in that experience, whether, again, it was in consulting or teaching or whatever it was, they actually uh, became, they knew, they became, no, they they knew themselves better at the end of it, uh, and they were a more interesting person uh, in terms of that experience. So again, more often than not, we have students who have taken some time between their undergraduate degree and applying to medical school, um, and, and we look at that as part of their life's pathway and enriching as it often is. And, and that really can't be anything. I mean, we admitted. We had a rodeo star a couple years ago. I was like, you got to admit the rodeo guy, you know, <laughs> and actors, you know, just as I say, people who, because it's experience and they learn just from experience in the world. So whatever it was, it was something that they really wanted to do. But I'd like, like to make a friendly amendment to something. Uh, by that, Teach for America? No, no, no. <laughs> do that no matter what. <laughs> no, I could go there too, but I think that's probably not a good idea. No, uh, I, I just want to point out that your gap between undergraduate and going on to graduate school is not the only time that you have an opportunity to gain rich experience and do what you really want to do and have fun. Some of us have yes, done that all our lives. And I'd like to comment on that because, Larry, you're, you are inspirational in terms of reaching across the university and creating all of these combined degrees, and we're sort of following suit. We've reached out uh, with the help of Derek Bolton from the business school and, and Garth. To, we have students who are uh, pursuing an MBA. It's actually our most common combined degree at this point. We have students, we have a student who just graduated from the School of Education with a Master of Education because he thinks when he finishes his MD and he does a psychiatry residency, he wants to make an impact on K through 12 education in the community in which he's practicing. We have a student uh, who thought she was going to get an MD, JD, didn't, but now we have a, a, a certified, uh, blessed, combined degree with the law school. We have 
students who are pursuing an MPH. We have a combined degree with Berkeley. We have several combined degrees on our school itself, one in clinical research, another one in health services research. We have a student who's pursuing a master's in public policy, which is a, a degree which is available on campus. And our most unique student, which is very cool, uh, just completed the, her master's in the interdisciplinary program in environment and resources, which uh, is mainly at the Woods Institute, but as you know, it's, a, it's not in any of the schools specifically. So the fact that this campus has reached to all of our schools being connected and our students can capitalize on that, either by getting combined degrees or more commonly just going over to the business school or the law school or the school of education and, and getting enriched along with their medical degree. It's fabulous. It's a terrific environment for that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would agree. It's just, a, it's extraordinary. It's one of the great things about, about this university. We're up to about uh, 60 students out of quarter 380, 390 who uh, are either taking joint or, or dual degrees. And so that's one way to bring the university in. We have a variety of classes that, that we offer where uh, the students work in, in project teams across the schools. Uh, if you're, you know, a lot of problems require someone from the medical school to identify the problem, somebody from the engineering school to, to bring the technology to solve it, and somebody from the business school to figure out how do you figure out what a business model is to, to turn this thing uh, into a company. And, and all, of the, all of the big questions, all of the big problems require uh, multiple lenses to be brought to bear. I, I just, the way we conceptualize it, at the law school, is, is the first year they're law students, which is to say we have them inside the law school and they take a set of classic courses that really sort of give them a foundation in the particular methodology of legal analysis. And then in the second, we think of that as preparing them not to be lawyers, but as preparing them to be law students. And then second and third year, the university is the law school. I mean, that's really the way we think about it. So you're not going outside the law school. It's that in order to really succeed, there's a variety of skills that you need, some of which are offered in our school, but tons of which most aren't. They're offered in the other schools and departments. They're part of the legal education. And so part of, and it's the same thing, so getting the students <clears throat> mixing in. The joint degrees to me were a, an edge, but it's really you know getting the students mixing in classes. They have different intellectual cultures, so they think about problems differently. They, you know, students learn from each other way more than they learn from us, from their teachers. It's osmotic. And so just creating a culture in which everybody's all mixed you know, it's ironic because we're basically moving against what had been the historical trend, which had been to create schools and departments and specialize within. And, the, and I think, you know, the future is more actually, as I said, the university is just a place where there's all sorts of skills and knowledge that you can pick up. And we just have to tailor it so every student can put together the combination that they need. And that's really, I think, where the university is going with large. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.